Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we hope you had a nice lunch break and have been enjoying the sessions from this morning. We are only uh, part way through the first day, and we are already off to an amazing start with so many talented uh, presenters. To keep this momentum going, I, I am here to introduce you to our next keynote speaker, a special friend and a colleague, Professor Dr. Ander Chetan. Dr. Chetan, who's currently a professor at Middle East Technical University, is very talented engineer whose research has made significant contributions to the field of theoretical soil mechanics, foundation, and earthquake engineering. Dr. Chatton completed his PhD from University of California at Berkeley, researching seismic soil liquefaction, triggering response of fully saturated cohesionless soil. His manuscript, which presents the proposed triggering relationship, received the Thomas Middlebrook Outstanding Professional Accomplishment Award offered by the American Society of Civil Engineering Geo Institute in 2006. The resulting seismic soil liquefaction triggering methodology has since been widely accepted and used in engineering practice, as well as established the basis of engineering design for a number of engineering codes of practice, ASHTO 2010. In addition to his research, Compute contribution, Dr. Chetan has served as a geotechnical earthquake engineering consultant in several national and international mega projects, including the Istanbul Marmari Submerged Tunnel, Istanbul Canal, Sinop Nuclear Power Plants, Warsaw Poland Metro Line, Effler Geothermal Power Plant, Oman Dukam Port, and many, many more. He has and continues to serve as an external expert and consultant to International Atomic Energy Agency in, an, in a number of missions and workshops on seismic hazard, geotechnical aspects and hazard and site evaluation, and safety requirements for nuclear power plants. I had the opportunity to work very closely with Dr. Chetan on the liquefaction model that we use in our rock science soil settlement software, Settle3. I've also had the pleasure of conducting several courses with Dr. Chetan over the last many years. Professor Chetan continues to serve our engineering community as a lecturer, consultant, researcher, and today as a keynote speaker at this event. So without further ado, here to speak on the recent advances in seismic soil liquefaction engineering is a professor under Chetan. Professor Chetan. Dr. Yakub, a very nice introduction, but I don't believe I deserve all those nice words. That is very kind of you. Uh, my only title here is uh, a family member, a family member of uh, Rock Science uh, Group. Uh, I'm very excited to basically share my uh, experience about seismic soil liquefaction engineering. Uh, before I proceed uh, with the presentation, definitely I need to uh, acknowledge all the coordination help that was provided by Rock Science Group. So we are basically joining this conference from the luxury of our homes, maybe from our offices. So you, the audience, deserve a good morning, maybe a good afternoon, maybe a good evening, maybe a good night, depending on which side of the earth uh, you join uh, to this international conference. So I really appreciate everybody's attendance and the organization committee's uh, help and coordination efforts. Uh, before proceeding with the presentation, I owe another uh, acknowledgement uh, to my uh, co-author, Dr. Bidge. Without his help, we could not compile uh, the keynote manuscript as well as this presentation, so his contributions are deeply acknowledged. Let me proceed with the outline. Uh, hopefully, I will finish my presentation. Uh, oops. I guess it comes with a delay. So why don't I go back? Excellent. Uh, this is the outline of my presentation. Most likely it will take about 30 minutes. Please sit back and enjoy this uh, talk. Uh, I tailored this particular presentation for young practicing engineers. So I 
uh, apologize if you're expecting a more advanced uh, technical presentation. This is more of a basic presentation, which addresses some of the advanced issues, but honestly, because of the time limitations and due to the complexity of the problem itself, I am not going to go into the detailed discussions. What I will do is I will start with discussing what soil liquefaction is, then we will briefly talk about surface manifestation of seismic soil liquefaction. And then because we're all engineers, we will talk about how we may handle this liquefaction engineering problem, uh, addressing liquefiable soils, liquefaction triggering relationships, residual strength of liquefied soils, seismic deformations after soil liquefaction, and maybe one slide about mitigation alternatives. Uh, having said that, Let's start with a general uh, definition, but before proceeding that, let's uh, re remember that soil is a unique material. It is unique in very many senses because it's a natural material. It is also unique that it uh, doesn't come with a user manual. What do I mean by that? For example, concrete, other civil engineering materials, steel, they come with a user manual. We know their characteristics very well. Actually, sometimes, not sometimes, almost always, we order that material. However, with soil, that is not true. So the soil strength and stiffness is very much a function of it is confining stress. So basically, same sand in a bucket may exhibit large stiffnesses and strength, and the same sand as in this cartoon that you see, uh, if it is not confined, then may not resist to even very low stresses. So having made that uh, introduction, I will come up with a general definition about soil liquefaction. Soil liquefaction is defined as significant reduction in shear strength and stiffness due to increasing pore water pressure. You see in this uh, very well-known sketch that this is how the load transfer mechanism is between gran gra grains of granular materials before the earthquake, this is how the uh, load is transferred. And because of seismic shaking, pore water increases. It breaks the contact between particles. Look at this particular material. This grain is floating in the water and it doesn't contribute much to the overall uh, contact uh, force distribution mechanism. So if the pore pressure increases, effective stress decreases, shear strength and strength also decreases relevant to that. So what happens? What are the surface manifestations? Sometimes because of the increased pore pressure, that excess pore pressure through the cracks can come up to the ground surface and may form some beautiful sand volcanoes. As in two cases, you see that. We may have some lateral spreading cases. This, for example, Izmit Bay, underlain by sandy soils, clay crust, floated on the liquefied soil. Another example, a famous San Fernando Dam, uh, some uh, basically coastal stru structures. Uh, you may see that they were damaged. Uh, famous Niigata case, toppled buildings. Another case from Adapazare, Turkey. Look at this building, settled about 80 centimeters. People used to climb up the stairs and enter the building. Now the building settled. A uh, tilted building, again, all bearing capacity problem, look at it as if it sinks into the soil. And if you have some uh, buried structures, empty tanks, because of increased pore pressure, they may float to the ground surface. So these are our surface manifestations, port structures, other examples of lateral spreading and so on. These are the manifestations that we observe. Let me elaborate more on liquefaction definition, but this time more specific definitions. This is a typical stress strain relationship. Uh, it is a strain softening response. As you can see that under static conditions, this is my strength. This is the uh, demand from my system. As you see that the system can fulfill this demand with a factor of safety, roughly, let's say one and a half, but if the earthquake shakes us back and forth, all of a sudden now my strength is at the residual part. The structure is still there demanding this red line, red shear stresses. But unfortunately, my strength is not enough to fulfill that 
that demand. So a significant failure mechanism is expecting us. This is what is known as flow of liquefaction. In other cases, we are sometimes more lucky. Earthquake shakes us back and forth, increase pore pressure, decrease effective stresses. Luckily, uh, just by chance, earthquake may stop before we hit the failure envelope. So no yielding occurs, but the problem is that effective stresses decrease. Because of that, we may accumulate some deformations. Another mode of soil liquefaction, which we call cyclic mobility. Sometimes we're not that lucky. The earthquake continues back and forth, and we hit the failure envelope, and then we pass up. The earthquake doesn't need to stop because the soil yields. It is oscillating back and forth, and each time it passes through the origin, as you may guess, the confining stress is very low, almost none. So the strength and stiffness is very small. That is basically, we observe this banana loops. One is passing through the origin. We have some flow mechanism, a viscous liquid, followed by, again, dilation and contraction cycles. Flow passing through the origin, dilation, and contraction cycles forming banana loops, as we call, again, cyclic liquefaction. These are all covered under soil liquefaction discussion. Uh, do we see the evidence in the laboratory? Yes, absolutely. These are laboratory test results. As you see that the theoretical mechanism is observed in the laboratory environment. You see the banana loops, very well formed, large deformations accumulated, and so on. So liquefaction is real. And I have provided you a good, not a good, but a brief theoretical background about soil liquefaction. Now we're engineers, we would like to deal with this problem. So there exist five engineering steps about liquefaction engineering. And the first step is, do we really expect liquefaction to trigger? Uh, the second step, if yes, liquefaction is expected, then what is the strength of my liquefied soil? If I don't expect a big stability problem, even though the soil liquefies, then the next question is, what are the deformations or displacements after liquefaction? If the displacements are acceptable or not, this is where in the fourth step we will deal with that. Then we will jump to the fifth step that we need to mitigate if those deformations are not acceptable. So those are five engineering steps that we need to cover as part of liquefaction engineering. And in this short presentation, I will briefly address those issues don't expect much, but I, my goal is to increase awareness about those liquefaction engineering steps. The first question is, uh, which soils are potentially liquefiable? So let's study that. And after that, the next question is, uh, how are we going to know that if my soil will liquefy or not under a, a scenario earthquake? Potentially liquefiable soils. We very well know that fully saturated sandy soils the revels, they're potentially liquefiable. Uh, then you may ask, how about uh, silt and sand mixtures? Uh, silt, clay, sand mixtures. Then we need to have uh, more detailed uh, studies. These are some of the options when you have fine grain soils. If your soil still qualifies as liquefiable, this is, you look at the elasticity index, water content normalized with liquid limit. And if you fold this in, the, in this region, you're liquefiable. Here you may test anywhere else you say, oh, we don't liquefy. And here are some alternative methods that suggest that. Uh, and Chinese criteria is outdated. We don't recommend the use of it. So please do not use that. And also like uh, another recommendation by Boulanger and uh, Idris, simply looking at the plasticity index. Uh, alternatively, uh, my co-author, uh, Dr. Bilge and myself, we studied that and we defined liquefaction as the formation of banana loops in the laboratory. And then we come up with this other classification. So liquidity index, PI, plasticity index. So if you are here, you may generate banana loops if you're in this region. If you're in that region, you don't uh, generate banana loops. So only cyclic mobility is a potential problem for you, but not cyclic liquefaction. So this is an alternative again to assess 
the liquefaction susceptibility of uh, fine-grained uh, soils or fine soils within the sand uh, mixture. All right, so we clarified that potentially liquefiable soils are polysaturated sands and gravels and silt, clay, sand mixtures. Then we have some methods to check if they're still potentially liquefiable. After making that uh, first preliminary assessment, the next step is we need to check if my soil will liquefy under the seismic shaking expecting us. So x-axis is my capacity term, y-axis is my demand term, that is basically y-axis represents the seismic shaking intensity, x-axis represents the uh, resist, uh, resistance of my soil. In this particular case, we have SPT blow counts to represent the capacity and cyclic stress ratio to represent the uh, basically the demand term. Uh, we have CPT, shear wave velocity as the alternatives. And here are, you see some uh, select examples of triggering relationships. As you see that the dots are the sites that liquefied, circles non-liquefied, you see the boundary between them is not very exact. So that is why some probabilistic boundaries are recommended. If you're in this region, you're, like, you're expected to liquefy here, non-liquefied, SPT, CPT, and shear wave velocity. These are existing relationships. Then you're gonna ask me, uh, Professor, how am I going to estimate CSR? A very simple procedure. We estimate CSR cyclic stress ratio uh, as a function of peak ground acceleration, total stress, effective stress, and because soil column is not rigid, in fact, it does some belly dancing movement. So R sub D takes into account the flexibility of the soil. So by using the simple expression, we can calculate cyclic stress ratio. As you see that, this is the demand term for your earthquake. But you need to convert that earthquake to the reference event, which is a magnitude seven and a half, representing a, a soil at one atmosphere vertical effective stress conditions. To be able to make that normalization, we apply series of correction terms in addition to our sub D, which I will briefly talk about. Because soil column is not a rigid column, it does belly dancing movement uh, during earthquake shaking. Uh, we use a nonlinear shear mass participation correction applied on CSR. And here are some examples. You see that those correction changes with depth of the liquefied layer. So the deeper you go, the lower the R sub D value. And I showed you some uh, values. Again, what did I say? Different magnitude events. But remember, my uh, chart solution is for a magnitude seven and a half event. So to be able to consider durational differences, we need to apply a correction. This is what we call magnitude. In fact, it is a duration scaling factor. The same is also uh, true uh, for uh, vertical stresses and sloping sites. But before that, I would like to talk about durational uh, correction factors. You see that if your earthquake is a magnitude seven and a half, you don't need to apply any correction. For any other magnitudes, you may choose a value and apply your correction. Do you see what a big range of corrections we have? So luckily the Chetin's uh, recommendation is right in the middle and you may conveniently use that, but I give you options. You see some of the correction factors that is used in the literature. Uh, also, remember my site, uh, the reference value was one atmosphere. What if your critical layer is not at a depth where the vertical effective stress is not one, one atmosphere? Then you need to apply another correction, which we call K sigma correction. K sigma correction takes those different stress levels and convert to an equivalent one atmosphere value. So here are our options uh, regarding the K sigma correction. The situation is not as bad as duration scaling factors. They vary between one and 1.4, and 1.2 is not a very uncommon value to use for K sigma corrections. If your site is not a free field site, as in the case of a dam, for example, or under a building, there exists shear stresses, then you need to consider that and make that correction because K 
case histories are mostly compiled from free field level sites. So we call that correction K alpha correction. And here are some examples of how you make, make that K alpha correction. Uh, so I have simply addressed some of the issues that are problematic with cyclic stress ratio, which is actually the demand term. Let's take a look at the uh, capacity term from standard penetration test point of view. You know that we apply a series of corrections on standard penetration test. Today, I will only address two corrections. One is the short rod correction. The other one is the energy correction in the literature. This is a advanced and very fresh information. This is the NCA recommendation that everybody uses. However, recent measurements indicate that we are overcorrecting for short rod effects. And also our understanding about the energy measurements are improving. Maybe a safety hammer doesn't have 60% energy in the average. So please expect some new developments about these two issues in the near future uh, if you follow the literature. Also, if you have some fines in your soil, you need to apply uh, what we call fines correction. For example, 20% fines, you increase your SPT blow counts by about three to four. Uh, some of the corrections are a function of M160. And this is a summary of available fines corrections that you may use for correcting uh, for the effects of fines. Uh, SPT relationships, there exist uh, different options. More or less, they are saying the same thing. They have some differences. And as you, if you ask my opinion, guess what? I will say Chetin's method is the best, but that is what the, all of the authors say because it is their babies. Anyways, and uh, so you have options. Regarding the CPT, I have also shared some of the available relationships in the literature. Shear wave velocity, thanks to uh, Professor Kane, uh, we have a recent study. And then you see the options available regarding the shear wave velocity measurements. Uh, all right, having said that, you may say, Professor, why don't you give us an illustrative example? Let's perform an illustrative assessment. Uh, the first thing, you have two options. You may perform a deterministic uh, approach, yes or no type of uh, analysis. Or you may understand that this boundary is not very certain and perform a probabilistic analysis. If you perform a deterministic analysis, 50% probability of liquefaction is your boundary term. Anything on the left-hand side will liquefy. Anything on the uh, right-hand side will not liquefy. That simple, yes or no type of assessment. So if you would like to calculate factor of safety, then you use this red curve as your capacity curve after series of uh, corrections, then find your value. And then the demand term is divided by the capacity term. And then you calculate your factor of safety. That simple. I know it is not that simple. I know it is a little bit confusing and uh, difficult. I will have a suggestion in a minute or so. Let's do an example with you. Hypothetical case N160, 9.3. Don't say, don't think that uh, 9.3 is the actual SPT block. And after corrections, you have basic numbers with decimals. Otherwise, we don't have uh, uh, SPT block counts with uh, decimals. Uh, okay. I choose the R sub D value for the depth that I'm interested. Uh, I use the first option. I calculate my CSR, my magnitude correction my duration correction, uh, K alpha uh, 1.0, because this is a level side. After all the corrections, my CSR is 0.16. My resistance CRR from the 50% probability curve 0.06, divide them to each other. You calculate your factor of safety 0.55. That means your site will liquefy if you are a believer in deterministic approach. If you're a believer in the probabilistic approach, then you may do the same analysis, but this time you're lucky. You don't need to perform these corrections externally. It is buried in the closed form solution. That is the major advantage of Chetin's methodology. So the corrections are automatically handled 
within the closed form solution. So C CRR is estimated and probability of liquefaction in this closed form expression is calculated as 99% probability of liquefaction. So this is an obvious liquefaction case. And look at the point, it falls right here. And as you can, you can easily see that, that falls in, in the crowded liquefied region, which is designated by black dots in the, in the picture. Excellent. Uh, you know that it is a little bit consuming. Thanks to rock science family, they implement this procedure into Settle 3D. So it does apply those corrections for you, do the estimations, and then provide you the answer in the luxury of using a software. I have a recommendation. Softwares are wonderful if you know what they are doing. So please learn what they are doing, then enjoy the comfort of using a software. Uh, having said that, now we have an understanding about liquefaction triggering. Let's quickly talk about what is the strength of liquefied soil. If the SP2 blow count is 12, you look at it like the strength of a liquefied soil is about 20 kPa, which is very low. What do you expect? It is like a viscous liquid. So the, definitely uh, the strength will be very low. Some other methods, Boulanger and Idris, Stark and Masri, Wang and Kramer, Weber et al. These are two recent studies and they're probabilistic. I love to use them. Uh, so there exist tools about finding this strength of liquefied soil and you may perform some stability assessments, post liquefaction stability assessment by assigning the strength of the liquefied soil to the layer where you expect liquefaction and perform a stability analysis. That is wonderful. If the vector of safety is greater than one, that means you don't expect a global stability problem even though the soil is liquefied. So these are uh, common and you need to perform this analysis. So if you don't expect a global uh, stability problem, then the next step is how much deformation do you expect? Then I will ask you the question, what kind of deformations are you talking about? Are we talking about settlements or volumetric compressions? As in this building case, the building beautifully settled 80, 85 centimeters. Uh, or are we talking about shear strains as in the case of lateral spreading? So lateral movement. Uh, so we may perform assessments individually for settlements or for shear strains. I will start with volumetric settlements. There exist some chart solutions. If you know the SPT blow count, it tells you the volumetric compression, 2% volumetric compression, 1% volumetric compression. If you have a two meter thick liquefied soil uh, with 2% volumetric compression, then you will expect to have four centimeter of settlement if everything runs ideally as you expect. Uh, Chatin at all as a closed form solution, you may enjoy to estimate those volumetric strains. And moreover, those uh, settlements were calibrated with the field data. Remember everything we calculate by this uh, chart solutions or closed form solutions, they are based on laboratory test results. The real field may be differently behaving than the uh, laboratory tested sample. So we calibrate our results with the field uh, settlement measurements, and we find a calibration coefficient, which was discussed again in Chetin and Bilge, and the details of which I will not go. Uh, how about other alternatives? Zeng et al., Yoshimini, Yi, Idris and Boulanger have other alternatives. If you know the CPT value, you may find out the post liquefaction volumetric strength. How about lateral deformations? Uh, professor, we would like to know lateral spreading. Then you may use empirical relationships, uh, magnitude of the event, distance terms, and so on. Or you may use laboratory-based shear strain estimation uh, based uh, results that are, will be used for lateral spreading calculations. Sliding block analysis or 2D, 3D numerical simulations with advanced liquefaction constitutive models, which are also possible alternatives. Uh, 
Having said that, uh, after we calculate those deformations, the question is, okay, are they acceptable for my structure? For example, you will calculate five centimeter settlement, 55 centimeter settlement, 85 centimeter settlement. Then you will ask the question, is it acceptable? Probably 85 is not acceptable for a conventional building. Probably about a couple of centimeters, maybe five centimeters. If you have a raft foundation, maybe 10 centimeters is acceptable, but not beyond that. Uh, lateral deformations. Believe me, our structures are less resistant to lateral deformations. So probably five centimeters lateral movement of a column is enough to cause structural damage. Uh, if the answer is no, those deformations are not acceptable, then mitigation. This is my last slide. I know you're tired. I know uh, I have used an extended bit of uh, time, but let me finish it. The first option is, ladies and gentlemen, this is engineering. Uh, we are not Don Quixote's. So we don't need to fight uh, against windmills. The first option is escape, leave this site, find another site. Believe me, this could be your uh, best option. If not, you have to stay there. Then what you need to do is you may uh, densify the soil. So increase your SPT blow counts philosophically. Uh, options, dynamic consolidation, compaction piles, vibratory probes, vibration is good. <coughs> Some examples you see, Sometimes we use rigid columns. So we say, okay, if the soil liquefies, at least I want to transfer the load to deeper soils. In that case, you may use jet grout columns or deep soil mixing columns as your mitigation options. Wow, that was a bombardment about liquefaction. But again, the idea was to expose you to liquefaction engineering. So I introduced a uh, the young practicing engineers, available tools in the literature. And if you would like to learn more about it, you can refer to our manuscript or go back and look at the original references. Uh, gentlemen, it looks like I did an okay job. I consider the time limitations well, so I don't have anything else to say. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Chetan, for an excellent presentation on liquefaction. We have several questions already that have been posed. I will start with the first one. Reginald, uh, the first please one. start with the simple one, please. This is the simplest I found. Oh, love it, <laughs> love it. I love simple questions. <laughs> the gentleman is asking, in the CSR calculation, is A max the ground acceleration at low periods, or is it the maximum spectral acceleration? <clears throat> that is the peak ground acceleration. So it's peak, it is yeah. nothing to do with the spectral acceleration. So in fact, if you would like to uh, answer that question in the spectral domain, then I would say that is the spectral acceleration at zero period. Okay, all right. Excellent. See, I told you that was going to be an easy question. Next one is getting a little harder now, I guess. But approximately how long after a liquefaction process, does the soil re regain its shear resistance properties? Wow, that, that was a lovely question. That was a research type of a question. Uh, my biggest trick is when I receive a, a difficult question, I usually respond to that question by simply saying, it depends. And usually 99% of the time, I am correct with that answer. Uh, it depends on the permeability of the uh, environment. So if the excess pore pressure can dissipate immediately, that means we have permeable layers, uh, the system can uh, dissipate that excess pore pressure, I may say uh, recovery is rather quick. However, if your sand layer is sandwiched by clay layers on top and bottom, mm -hmm. that excess pore pressure may not quickly dissipate so it may require maybe longer time. Let's say a couple of days, maybe week, but I guess that is pretty much it. But I'm not talking about fabric recovery. I am talking about uh, water pressure to dissipate. Remember in soil mechanics, fabric recovery uh, may take forever in a geological sense. The longer they stay together, then the strength and increase 
uh, st strength and stiffness increase. I'm not referring to that uh, geological time uh, set. Okay, no, excellent, thank you. Another question, how can one reduce the scatter in the post-liquefaction settlements in the free field? The scatter uh, is given by the results. Okay, go ahead, go ahead. Yep, please go ahead. I guess uh, the uh, question is about uncertainties in the predictive models. Uh, yes, the different the empirical models. methods, yeah. Right, exactly. uh, gentlemen, uh, I like those uncertainties because uh, basically uh, that is a wonderful uh, way of learning how uh, comfortable we are at predicting uh, engineering parameters. Uh, soil liquefaction is a rather complex phenomenon and currently available mo models, uh, we provide uh, an answer, but the answer has a scatter, very well said, and different methods have uh, different predictions. So uh, one thing, one lesson to learn from that, uh, we are not very accurate and precise, both in the predictions. So we should admit that. And uh, the next step is, uh, whichever method you think is more reliable, then use that method because that will reduce the scatter. But don't ask me which method because I am biased. I will say my <laughs> I love that. A, a, a lovely question, but uncertainty is real. Uh, we need to realize that we, our predictions sometimes may be off. All right. No, thank you. One more question. I think this might be the last question. There are several other questions. We may not be able to take them all because I see we are getting to the end of the session, but maybe we can get another one after this. If we find out that our site is liquefiable, are you suggesting any quantified reduction in soil parameters when doing foundation analysis. Is there any? Absolutely, yes. Okay. Uh, one is that, for example, uh, you're performing a bearing capacity assessment uh, and you expect that uh, your site uh, will liquefy. Uh, for example, in between depths, uh, five meter and six meter, one meter tick liquefy, liquefiable soil, which is expected to liquefy during the earthquake. What you will do is, we know that as part of bearing capacity, bearing capacity is simply a slope stability assessment where there is no slope. So use your software, slide, and define the layers. Apply the surficial load and the layer which is expected to liquefy, assign the strength of the liquefied soil. Perform a bearing capacity assessment by using a simple slope stability tool if your factor of safety greater than one, that means a global bearing capacity problem is not likely. What is likely is deformation, settlement, maybe lateral movements, but not a globally induced bearing capacity problem as I showed in those buildings, uh, pictures in surface manifestation. So this is what I would recommend. This is how I would reduce the parameters and perform a conventional geotechnical engineering analysis. Fantastic. Last question. Very last question. The rest, as we have said, we'll compile them, we'll send them to you, Dr. Chetin, for comments, and then we'll email them to participants. I, I but, would love to, love to answer them because they were kind enough to attend. I would love to answer their question. Great. Any suggestions for estimating liquefaction potential in municipal solid waste or tailings? <laughs> that, that is a lovely question. Uh, tailings are, are uh, odd uh, soil deposits. They're not very common because they're specially treated and so on. Uh, and usually they have fine grains. Silt is, is a major uh, content of uh, tailing waste. So I would strongly suggest use the liquefaction potential assessments that I provided that is valid for fine grain soils. Remember, uh, silt, clay, uh, sand mixtures. If you uh, really qualify as potentially liquefiable, then you may use triggering relationships. But don't forget that majority of the case histories in liquefaction triggering database are not coming from tailings. But tailings are usually non-plastic silts. 
And as far as we know, non-plastic silts are babies of sands. And if sands are liquefiable, I think non-plastic silts, which are tailing dams, are also liquefiable. But if they have a plasticity index greater than 12, most likely they won't liquefy. No. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, we've come to the end of the session. Dr. Tamar Yakub. Uh, uh, Under, thank you so much for this wonderful, wonderful session. We enjoyed it. Uh, Dr. Chetan, uh, these questions and answers were very valuable. And I'm sure, uh, I, I'm sure the people here, they want to, to hear more. We will arrange another session. Thanks thank again you. and thank enjoy you. Thank you so much. I felt at home. I wish the best uh, to everybody during the conference. See you around. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>